Welcome. Hello, friends. I'm Stephen Reinley, director of the Speed Art Museum, and I am delighted to be joined in this month's Director's Cut conversation by my, my own colleague, Toya Northington. Toya has been working alongside of us at the Speed for a couple of years now. She came to the Speed with an incredible background with a master's in social work, her own career as an artist and researcher, um, and the founder of a nonprofit, arts oriented nonprofit called Art Thrust. Toya immediately put our community engagement work into high gear, leading our Speed for All program, our community connections, art making programs, and really launching us into an NEA Our Town grant with an artist in residence program in Russell. She had a full plate, but I knew that Toya was the one person within our colleague base who could manage the community engagement work for our current exhibit, Promise, Witness, and Remembrance. So she agreed after a little thinking and we reorganized her work temporarily to come on full-time as the community engagement strategist working with me and our guest curator, Allison Glenn, a community engagement steering committee, a national advisory panel and 80 plus colleagues to pull this work together in only a matter of months. Tonight, I'm gonna to talk to Tori, Toya, excuse me again, one more um, about one aspect. There are so many stories in this exhibit and one of the things Toya led the steering committee on was actually informing the selection of artworks that made up, make up the exhibit Promise Witness Remembrance. It was an unusual format and Allison Glenn made herself um, willing to present repeatedly to the steering committee to listen and to adapt her plans, the artists and the artworks that were included in the exhibit. In a future date, we'll talk about some of the other important works of the steering committee and the research committee, the programming and research they formulated, the ways that they're giving the community ways to process, um, the artists who are gonna be commissioned to respond to artworks in the exhibit. But I just wanna talk about the unique role that the steering committee played in selecting artworks for the show this evening. So thank you, Toya, for joining me for that conversation and joining this, this effort to begin with. Sure, thanks for having me. It's exciting. I'm glad we're gonna do this. So tell me a little bit, well, I know, but remind for our audience's sake, Talk about, you know, from the very beginning, it was towards the end of the year, you took on this new challenge and opportunity, and you said, here's how I want to put together a steering committee, and talk a little about how you did it and who ended up joining it. Yeah, um, so starting this project, um, I knew that um, there's a couple of hurdles or pitfalls that large institutions fall into. So when you do these big projects, especially if it's something around diversity or social practice, um, they'll hire someone. There'll be this Black elite person, and that person will represent all of Black community, or all whatever that community they're seeking to um, reach. Um, and with this particular um, subject and issue, and, and knowing how Breonna Taylor touched our community, I knew that was too great for me to take on. Um, I'm one person, right? I'm one perspective, I'm one opinion, um, and I have my own methods. So from the beginning, I knew it was important to pull together a diverse committee, right? Not just kind of the superficial committee that just has the name, but no authority or no autonomy over the project, but a real steering committee with different perspectives, different ages, different backgrounds, different disciplines, no discipline, right? Community members that have perspectives and opinions that you may not have on a lot of committees that have a lot to say, and a lot to add. And so I put together a wish list of what type of um, voices need to be at the table. And so it couldn't be perfect, right? I couldn't have everyone represented, but how can I get as many people at the table as possible? And then whoever I couldn't grab, I would try to grab through them through the engagement surveys and the focus groups, things like that. So talk, so you had members, you also told me, and I remember you said, if we don't have leaders from the protest movement, they're not gonna feel, they're gonna come at this exhibit and feel like we didn't wanna listen to them. And they've had the biggest role in the community. So you yeah. had a handful of them and who else? We had a um, member from, from the protest community. Um, and you know, there's a small representation from the protest community, but many others were asked. You know, I sent out 30 invites. Um, I had people from research communities. I had people who were academics. Um, I had people that were organizational leaders, and people in mental health, and people who were just active in the community, people you know. 
and who are active and they needed to be at the table. Um, and then we had um, Brianna Taylor's family, right? So that was key because we can think of all kinds of things that sound good to us. But at the end of the day, this was for Brianna, right? Brianna's family. And we wanted to make sure that we um, represented her in an authentic way. Sure. Um, you put it together so beautifully. And even though they weren't, you were, they weren't selected for any particular art background from your very first meeting, they had some strong questions and thoughts about the art that would be included or not included in the exhibit, right? Yes, and there were a few artists. I did forget that. Uh, there are some artists as part of the community as well. But I was surprised. You know, I was all prepared for us to talk about these social justice issues. And I was like, yes, what, what are the things that are important to us? And we spent the whole session, hour and a half, talking about um, really imbalances in the art world, right? You know, how this shows up in museums, how this shows up in galleries, how that um, artists have been marginalized, especially artists of color. So it was on top of the list of like, okay, if you're gonna do this exhibition on social justice, don't just talk about them over there, what they're doing and what collectively the world is doing, what part do you all play in this? So Allison had come to the table with a vision that was a little different, right? So she was um, bringing a lot of, had an idea of a lot of black artists, but not only black artists, but the committee had a different view. Yes. Um, and I think because the community lives in a in the context of what's happened here, right? Um, when we started this project, it was still really raw here. Yeah. You know, still a lot of pain, still a lot of hurt. It still is, um, but we were fresh on it at that time. And so it was important if we were going to take on this uh, and really do it justice, we had to be true about the representation, right? Everyone who came to the table had to be considered intentionally, what they brought, um, what they, who they represented, why they were represented um, in the work um, and how the community would read it, right? Because it wasn't just about us as an institution. We also had to remember that this is our bridge and our trust with the community that may not know us very well. And Allison, and Allison, to her credit, you know, realized that she is not a Louisvillian. She comes from somewhere else. She, she was bringing a national perspective. She needed to hear the local. And it wasn't necessarily what um, a national kind of perspective wanted to hear at first. And I think that was one of the rules of the steering committee is to say, you know, that's just not where Louisville's at right now. If this is a moment, if we were going to ever have a moment where you just declare this is going to be an exhibit with all Black artists, this is that moment. And we, would, we can understand why you might want to do it differently. And she adapted, so people should know. Um, in fact, in, with the steering committee's approval, there's only one white artist who happens to be Tyler Girth, a young man who died um, photographing the protests. So really, the exhibit also tells the story of several other people who died tragically kind of because of the protests and of events and being swept up in the movement following the killing of Randy Taylor. Um, but it wasn't just the identity of the artists. And so it is you now 17 black artists and Tyler Girth in the exhibit and really important Allison did follow through on that. But they also brought another local perspective about the artists included. Yeah, I mean, it was about, and that goes back to correcting the imbalances. So we know about museums histories. They're not, and not just us, just as an institution, we're not known for elevating local. Right. Usually you don't get success till you move away. You know, you find your success somewhere else and then you're brought into the museum system. There's a whole structure behind that. But it was important to say who is here that has been overlooked. Right. Or who is from Louisville that is ready, ready to be launched, ready to be um, in this um, higher level of art um, society, but hasn't been given that chance. Right. And that goes back to correcting the imbalance. So not just the local people that everyone knows, that everyone um, loves and has seen over years, but how can we elevate new faces, like new voices? So this is a launching pad. And it really goes back to um, how we are thinking about um, uprising and social justice here. What's that next level where we can elevate the community? And this was our way to do it through the art world. 
And I love that it included, as you said, and we'll talk about some of the specific examples. Um, one of them is a museum quality, an artist who's been shown in exhibits um, named Noel Anderson, who's mm -hmm. a professor at NYU. Allison had a take on him. She knew Noel Anderson's work. She didn't know he was from Louisville. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't know his work, so I was embarrassed saying now we have five works by him in the exhibit, and that's that's an impact, um, you know, where even great curators don't, don't always know the dots to connect. So the steering committee helped make that happen. But more in, in, a, in another way that really shaped the exhibit, they said we want to see one way to include artists as photographers, sorry, photographers who are photographing the protest and the movement following the killing of Breonna Taylor. So talk a little about how that went. Because then Allison said, I can't do that because the way a curator does that is has to live in the community, get to know artists over time, visit their studios, see their shows, watch their careers develop. She said, there's, you know, understandably, I don't have the kind of time that curators need to do that. So the steering committee said, we'll help. <laughs> yeah. And it was all, I can say everything was accelerated and it was all so very non-traditional. So it's not often, um, and to give Allison credit, it's not often that you not only have a steering committee to get perspective, we weren't really asking. You know, these weren't like statements. Could you please, I, well, you know, could you consider it? We were like, no, this is our list of things that we would like to see in this exhibition. And one of it was we need to elevate someone who hasn't been elevated before. And also, you know, this happened here because of the protests. Right. This exhibition, we wouldn't know you and you wouldn't know us and you wouldn't know Brianna Taylor if there weren't protests here. Mm -hmm. And it's because the institution is so close to Injustice Square. You can't ignore that. We can hear it. You know, it's, it's marching past our street. We've got staff in the protest. In fact, we have staff in the protest photos. So <laughs> it's not something distant to us. This is part of the story. And you can't tell a story about Brianna Taylor without telling the story about the protest. So um, we, we said, okay, well, let's make this happen. How can we make it happen? And um, Allison said, hey, well, do you know some photographers? And um, actually the steering committee compiled a list and everybody put their um, suggestions on there. And we sent that to Allison and said, okay, these are our suggestions. And Allison was able to pick her own um, images from that, right? We didn't, we didn't step into that part. Um, that's her creative vision. And we didn't want to have that much um, control, but we did want to make sure that when people walk into that exhibition, they are seen. And if we didn't have enough local Louisville scene, then um, it wouldn't have felt like it was for them. It would have been for us, right? And that wasn't the tone we wanted to build with our community. And you see now with the exhibit open, it's so interesting to watch. There's a big percentage of the visitors that go straight to those photographs to mm -hmm. see themselves, see someone they knew. But I also like what you said, because in the end, the committee and Allison worked in such a collaborative way. They said, we can be your stringers. Like we'll be your studio visitors. We're not gonna tell you which ones are best. They gave her a lot of photographers and yeah. so much content because it, photography was kind of well suited for it. You don't have to see it in person. Um, and she look, could look at so much to say she chose five photographers, four in addition to Tyler Girth. Um, I remember she had four and she said, I'm not finding a woman. I can't do this. Mm -hmm. I have, we got to have a woman represented. But she found Tia Yarrow, um, whose work is there. And now it's going to be featured, I think, was well, featured in the exhibit. And um, so I think that's the other balancing act that this is, as you said, it's so not typical, right? On the one hand, you all weren't saying, please curator, here's our wish list. You were saying, we need to see this. And she was saying, well, this is how curators need to work. Can you adapt to help me do that? And then they said, yes, if we give you enough content, can you do your job? Do we respect your independence as a curator? And then it worked out. So it's, it's a beauty to behold that corner and how she's situated against Terry Atkins' work, which is a monument mm -hmm. to the first protest for Black Lives Art, maybe in 1917 in New York. So there's a wonderful kind of interplay of contemporary art. Yeah, definitely. And there's a dialogue that happens. And just like um, we're creating a dialogue between the local, the personal, and the national, there's a dialogue between artists, right? And one person starts off that conversation and the others continue it. But because the exhibition was rooted in now, we need to just show how people are expressing that or are interacting with that content now. And I think there are probably a lot of 
female artists and photographers who were there at the protest. But that's another place where it's easier to get exposure if you're a male photographer, right? And a male artist, and if you are a female uh, photographer, a female artist. So it's all those little things that slide into the system that keep people hidden that we're just starting to uncover. And it's not until you realize that, hey, wait, why don't we know who these female photographers are that we can correct it? Because we, if we don't know there's an issue there, we can't really solve the problem. I just think it's a good point because museums, I think, used to say, I'm sure there are good art, black artists out there. I just don't know who they are. It's uh-huh. like, you go uh-huh. find them. And I just to mention the story you said when we had our very first um, tour for our colleagues of the exhibit, one of our friends and colleagues said, I don't know if you all know this, but I'm in one of these protest photos. And there she is holding a camera. So she, uh-huh. in turn, was a, was a yeah. protest photographer. Um, I want to wrap up with, I think, on some ways, um, not the most interesting, but the most unexpected request or response that the committee had to Allison, I think she presented was pretty much, well, I guess she thought it was a near complete checklist and they had a very specific kind of aesthetic reaction. Oh yeah. I think um, one thing I, I feel that people underestimate is that they'll say, oh, you know, only trained artists or, you know, only trained historians understand art. But contemporary art, no, you can see it and have a reaction to it. And you understand what speaks to you. And um, if you lean into it, you know, you can really um, get the feel of what that space would be and what, you know, the artist is saying. And so when they, when Allison presented the checklist, um, there was a reaction like, oh, wait, we had spent so many weeks talking about Breonna Taylor and started off saying, who is Breonna Taylor? Um, as a person, what does she mean? And we've written it down. So when we seen the exhibition checklist, we wanted to see Brianna, right? We didn't want to see like a general version of um, racism or social justice. We, we were like, okay, where is Brianna represented in this checklist? And of course, you know, we have Brianna Taylor's family. So in case you don't take our word for it, we're going to ask, is this Brianna? You know, and one of the things that was called out is that in our attempt to decolonize the space, which I'm all for, you know, leading the charge for that, uh, it was the dark kind of corridor in the old galleries, right? So the space was dark, but the art was dark too. Like it was very monotone and and monochromatic. And of course, with a lot of um, this subject matter, it it leans that way. But uh, the idea was that we can't forget that this exhibition started because of Breonna Taylor. And it was important to um, redefine the narrative around her as a person in her life. And so to call that was like, Breonna was lively. Breonna was fun. Breonna loved color. You know, she loved to laugh. Um, So we, we need some more life into this exhibition. You know, we need more color. We need more movement. Uh, we need more light. And um, one of the things I tell people is that the witness section, if you're looking for the steering committee, and people always ask, well, which parts were you all? That witness section, that's us. So yeah. when you see Sam Gilliam, when you see the process photographs, when you see Nick Cave, when you see Noel Anderson, that was direct steering committee. Like those are um, selections that come from our feedback. There was color, there is whimsicalness. Um, we're pushing boundaries and expectations. Um, there's power and privilege that's been ev- elevated, right? All of those things are part of the witness section. And the exhibit got better for it. And to her credit, Allison adapted. And mm-hmm. you know, like a great curator, Ken, she mm-hmm. figured out. She looked to our own collection. And um, we'll show a picture um, during this. that She pulled up um, one of the unbelievable Sam Gilliams we own. Sam Gilliam, another, also answered another Louisville native who grew up here. Um, his carousel piece from 1969. You're right. It's so, it's there's so many centerpieces of that witness section, but his is just full of color. We've never shown it completely away from the wall, so you can walk around it now. Really, um, I, I remember my first conversation with Brianna Taylor's mother, Tamika Palmer, and she said what she loved about Amy Sherrill's portrait was that it depicted her daughter's uplifting spirit. I think mm-hmm. what you're saying is the exhibit needed to do that. And Sam's work does while well, also showing that in 1969, an amazing black artist's response to a very similar time, assassination, civil unrest, racial unrest, could be an act of abstract painting in color. Mm-hmm. 
and it could be brightness and fabric and drapery um, in the galleries taking up a lot of space. So um, I hope people will come and see that and know that um, this exhibit is in a very traditional way, represents the vision of a very gifted curator, but one who adapted and flowed and an exhibit also that I have never seen a community voice shape and reshape over a months long period as, it, as we got to opening day. So there's so many stories to tell out of the steering committee and I will we'll, we'll reconnect for more of those, but thank you for sharing. Um, so people can see this exhibit, you can feel community in it, but to really know the steps you took and led. Thank you, Toya Norlington. Thank you.